<clears throat> okay, so anything else apart from SDL? There was uh, an interesting discussion about chat GPT. Uh, so let me go quickly there. Uh, yep, let's go to issues. Oi, oi, oi. So let me Okay, so we do have this uh, chat GPT chat uh, on the on the issue tracker. And uh, one student tried to have some nice conversations and you can have a very good uh, conversations with, um, yeah, so Oyston had uh, a good uh, examples of how to use it. And I think it's very good. Um, so you can, you can, if you didn't check it, you can check it out. Uh, you can learn about things, right? So he had uh, a question about monads, like uh, trying to understand what monads are and how they work. And there was a question, if all lists are considered monads, and then the answer is no, not all lists are considered monads and blah, blah, blah. And it goes into some explanations. And then I asked the same question uh, or similar question. I said, can you tell me if all lists in Haskell are monads? <laughs> and it said, yes, of course, all lists are monads. <laughs> So, you know, you, you can say, so are the lists monads or not, right? Um, and it is kind of a difficult question because the word lists can mean multiple things. It can mean actual type and list as a type in Haskell is a generic type and the list type is actually a monad uh, in general. So all, all lists are, are correct like this answer is more correct than the other one, but the other one is not quite wrong neither. So there are some elements of the answer which are correct and some elements of the answer which are not correct, right? So it's actually really difficult to distinguish when the chat GPT makes a mistake and when it is correct. So like for some of his examples, uh, it's very good, like uh, for explaining, for example, like how those functions work and so on. It, the explanations are perfect. Like uh, there, there are no mistakes, but for some conceptual things, uh, it is kind of a, a little bit too complex to um, to chat with with it because you have to be quite precise. Um, uh, and, and then it actually uses correctly, like it says the list type in Haskell, right? So here it says all lists in Haskell are monads, but that's kind of strictly speaking, not correct because like if we treat a list as a concrete, um, uh, as a concrete value uh, uh, instance, then it it in itself it's not a monad, right? So let me show you. So if we go to GHCI, right? So if I ask a question. So if I have um, if I have a which is a list of integers, right? So I have this. So now that the type the type of a is what? What is the type of a? Yeah, yeah but more precisely. Yeah, almost because those are polymorphic, right? And I didn't for like like if I force it, if I say this guy is an int, right? And now I ask what's the type of that list, then it's a list of ints, right? Uh so if I do this and I force the first element to be an int, then the the Haskell knows, oh yeah, I, I got it, I got you. It's a it's a list of ints, right? But if I do this. Uh, the numbers are polymorphic. They are ge of generic type, right? They are numbers, right? So then Haskell infers that, okay, it's a list of some numbers, but the type A is still generic. It has constraints. The constraint is this type class, which says this cannot be a string, right? Uh, I cannot, for example, say um, A concatenated 
with um with a string. I cannot do that, right? It will say no, the types don't match. Uh, sorry, but the types don't match. But if I say concatenated with an int or uh, int integral number, or if I say concatenated with a float, it will be happy, right? It will say, yeah, yeah, I got you, it's fine. Because the constraint is kind of generic. So coming back to the question of monads. So is A a monad? Is A a monad? No, A is not a monad. Uh, a is a monadic value. It's a value inside a monad, but it's not a monad in itself, right? Uh, but the type of A, the type A has is a monad. So this type is a monad or this type is a monad, right? So when it says, all lists in Haskell are monads. Yeah, it should say all list types in Haskell are monads, not all lists, right? So it's, you see, and then it says list type. A list type in Haskell is defined as a monad. And that is a correct statement. This one is partially incorrect because it is not the list that are monads, it's the list types that are monads. And it is in fact that all list types are, are monads, right? So, I then ask it about concrete types. Uh, so can a concrete type be like, can an int or a maybe int be a monad? And it says, no, they cannot, but you can wrap it. And it kind of gives also kind of a good answer. So this answer is good uh, and doesn't contain any kind of mistakes. But at the same time, the first part of the answer is kind of a good. And the second part is like, why would you wrap it? It, it's very rarely that we do this uh, because for primitive types, for concrete types, you don't need this monadic operations. But yeah, anyway, so bottom line, you kind of need to be careful, right? And the, um, the interesting, right? So it all boils down to understanding what monads are and the best way who know if something is a monad or not, if you can do bind with it, right? So bind and return are the two operations which all monadic types have. So bind is defined like this. And you see that bind is defined as a function. So bind is a function which takes a monadic value and feeds it into a monadic function, right? So M is a monad. M A is a monadic value of some inside type A. And then A which transforms A to B within the monadic context is a monadic function, right? So terminology wise, a monad is a type, a generic type that has two operations defined on it. One is bind and another is return. And bind is defined to take monadic value and then apply a monadic function. So because we do have a question in the exam, like to recognize what is a monadic value and what is a monadic function. And the easiest test is if I have bind, is my thing, you know, monadic function, monadic function comes on the right-hand side and monadic value, comes on the left-hand side, right? So if, if something comes here and then you can bind it to a function, then it's a monadic value. But if you can put it here, then you know it's a monadic function, right? So that's the simplest test. Like if you remember that, then you will have a lot of uh, multi-choice answers in the exam kind of done correctly. So remembering this, if I have now my A, right, can I, Okay, so I have A and I have some sort of a function F, right? So will I have some notations like this or will I have F notation like this? Can I have A on the right-hand side and A is my list? 
No, I cannot, right? So I cannot have it like this, but can I have it like this? Yeah, maybe. So now the question to you is, um, remember we, we were treating list before. So remember A is one, two, three. Um, we were treating list before because lists are not only monads, they are also applicatives, right? And what is the definition of applicative? What is the, the two operations that applicatives need to have? So monads have to have return and bind. And applicatives? Pure, which is kind of equivalent to return, and fmap, right? Let's go into type of list. And we have applicative. So let's, I don't know if it will work. Yeah, it will, it kind of uh, works. So an applicative is, has a lot of things, but it has pure. So an applicative functor has a pure operator which given a un, you know unfunctor value wraps it inside the functor and then it has the uh, yeah this one and this one is a reverse f map right so we talked about it last time that this um I, I don't I don't know what the name of this operator is. The reverse of this operator is called fmap because fmap takes a value and uh, no, th this is actually uh, fmap. It takes a function and uh, given a value kind of that transforms, it applies this function into that into that value, right? Um, but if we check if we check, uh, this it takes a pure function and a robbed value and gives us a robbed value transformed by this function right so if, if you remember this so the definition of um of functor is actually the and remember that this like uh this one sorry and this one are uh, kind of the, the parameters are turned around. And in this case, you have a pure, um, yeah, yeah, anyway, like I will show you. So if you say pure, and if you apply it, if you apply it to um, a value, this is exactly the same of what this operator is doing, right? So this operator is kind of defined in terms of, of this one, if you do this, yeah, okay. So um, list, list is an applicative. So what we were doing is we had a function which is plus one and we had our list, our A. So how can we combine it, right? And one way of combining it was, you can say apply, um, apply this function to, to A. Or you could say map, sorry, you could say map plus one to A. They are exactly the same. And of course you could say um, map in uh, infix notation. And this is exactly the F map in infix notation, right? So that's how you combine an applicative value into the pure function. But if you have, if I have F, which is pure um, plus one, and it is in the context of a list, uh, Yeah, anyway, I, I, what I want to do is I want to say I have a pure uh, plus one, which is in a context of the list. And I want to combine now it with the list with A, then I would use this operator, right? 
So I have now two, three, four, because this plus one is not a pure function anymore. It is actually a function which is inside the context of my applicative functor, which in my case is a list. So this line, this line is exactly the same as if I said, I have a list of a function and I'm combining it with the applicative value, right? You, you're starting to get a pattern to see like how those are things compose. So my question is now let's treat A as a monad and let's treat how can I combine plus one with A, but this time I am treating A as a monad, not as an applicative functor, right? So for combining things in monadic contexts, we have to use a bind operator, right? So how can I bind A to plus one? Okay, we already know. So let's see if the comments work. Yep. So we already know A will have to be on the left-hand side, right? It cannot, because A is not a function. So I on the right-hand side, I have to have a function. So can I put plus one here directly? Can I do this? No. Why I cannot do this? Well, Let's have a look again quickly. Let's have a look at bind. So bind expects a monadic value, which is A, which is fine. And then on the right-hand side, it expects a function which takes a normal value and gives me a monadic context of a new value, right? And what is plus one? What is plus one? Plus one, uh, come on. Okay, let's let's do plus. So plus takes a value and another value and then produces me a value. There is no monadic context anywhere, right? So plus doesn't do, doesn't give me monadic, monadic context. So plus one is a carry. So plus one is like a shorter version of this, which looks like this, right? So now I cannot, I cannot do a bind plus one. So I need, on the right-hand side, I need a function which takes a normal value and produces a monadic context, right? So I can convert it. I can say, okay, let's take a lambda, which takes X and produces, um, and what is my monadic context here in the context of A? And A is a list. It's a list. So I would have to say X plus X plus one. So now what I'm doing is I'm passing like I have a lambda function and this lambda has one parameter, which is a normal number, which is, you know, from um, from the list of ints, it would be an int. And then it produces a new value inside this context, which is x plus one. So if we do that, uh, and remember, a was uh, one, two, three. So if we do that, we have two, three, four, right? Uh, so that works. So we could combine our monadic list with this monadic function, but there is a more clever way of rewriting that. And the more clever way of rewriting it is to use return. So I can say return plus one. Would that work? Almost. It would almost work. But what I need to have here is I here I need to have a function which takes a normal value and returns a rot. Right? So what what does this do? What what this does for me? It drops plus one function into a monadic context, so it gives me a list of a function. So th this part, this part, uh, 
returns a list of plus one, right? And I, I, and this is a monadic value again, and I cannot have a monadic value. I need a monadic function. So what is missing is a dot uh, because then I have a chain. So plus one is a carry, which expects a single value, single number, right? And then I am combining it with the return and return expects a normal value and it drops it into the monadic context. So now this will work. So if we execute that, we'll have the same as before, right? So yes, it is kind of like something different than you normally did in programming. It's kind of, uh, it has this uh, extra layer of uh, pattern uh, organization. But once you play with it, and once you kind of uh, get used to those uh, three operators, like uh, so, play with the with the F map, play with this uh, applicative uh, bind. Yeah, um, yeah. Let's ask. What is the name of? Let's go. Yeah, are the pronounceable names for common Haskell. All <laughs> uh, right. Yeah, so this one, we know it's bind. So we kind of know this one. Uh, okay. Yeah, so there is an answer saying, usually we read this star as apply uh, and the dollar as fmap. So, um, yeah, it's called apply. Yeah, so I guess we probably should call it apply. So, fmap, apply, bind, and then we have some uh, a little bit more exotic ones, which is like the sequencing, which we introduced last time. So if you play with those three and you get, or even with those three, uh, you will get kind of, uh, and of course for, for uh, monads you have return, which is very trivial. It just wraps the pure value into a monadic context. And for, um, for applicatives, you have uh, pure which is kind of an equivalent of, of return, right? So here, here you have monads and here you have applicative functors. So play with those uh, operators. Uh, and yeah, you, you will kind of uh, get, get to use them. Uh, and of course you have to play with space, which is the, um, the normal composition operator, so like space, and then this dot. And we last last week, we also talked about this one, right? So those are a little bit exotic, but once you play with them and once they become kind of a, your vocabulary, it will be kind of easy. All right, so any, any more questions about those? It just needs some time. So spend some time with it. So what else you need to spend time? Um, one aspect that we haven't really talked about is folds. So fold left and fold right. Uh, they are useful because they replace uh, recursion. You can do a lot of looping and a lot of constructs just using folds instead of using recursive calls. So please study that and kind of um, um, understand that, right? Uh, the easiest way to remember is that um, if we, we look into fold L, you will see that um, there is a, um, so we need to pass it a function which takes an, uh, yeah, so, for uh, left, um, we we usually 
like it, 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 the easiest way is to remember it with uh, with uh, with lists, right? So if you have a list, uh, so that's a traversable or foldable uh, type which we applying um, the uh, the fold on. Uh, and then we have to have the accumulator because a fault always com compresses, compacts a structure into a single value, right? So the list is like the second parameter. And then the first parameter to our fault is the accumulator. And when we're doing fold left, the accumulator is on the left-hand side of the function, which combines the value with the accumulator, right? If we compare it with the fold R, uh, you will see the sit situation is reversed. The accumulator is on the right-hand side. So the first difference is uh, if you have a function which kind of uh, robs our, our thing, if you're doing the left one, um, the accumulator is on the left-hand side. And then if you're doing the right one, the accumulator is on the right-hand side. Uh, and then the fold left goes from left to right. So fold left will kind of uh, go if, if I do... Um, Fold left plus one with A, and then the initial value for the accumulator is zero, then it goes, um, yeah. So it goes, oh, uh, come on, come on, come on. Um, Yeah, this error. Yeah, the uh, the plus one was the mistake because I'm I'm plusing with the accumulator, not with plus one. So this function has to take two arguments. The accumulator is on the left hand side because it's a fold L, and then the actual value which we're passing is on the right hand side. And we use the initial accumulator, which is this. And for this list, yeah, I will I will write it. I will write the list. And for this list, we start with one, uh, and then we have zero plus one. So th this does this, um, zero plus one, and then that becomes a new accumulator. And then we say plus two, that becomes a new accumulator. And then we say plus three. And that's the result. So this, this instruction has function which takes accumulator on the left hand side and goes from left to right. Okay. And then so that's the that's the sum. And then if we do the same with right, the opposite happens. So we have accumulator. So we start from right to left. And we start with the accumulator on the right hand side. So we say three plus zero. And then that becomes a new accumulator. And then the accumulator is on the right. And it says uh, two. And then again, accumulator is on the right hand side. And then we do one, right? So fold right does this and fold left does this. Cool. It sounds easy, but if you need to fold something, if I tell you like, uh, let's have uh, some uh, list with, with characters and we want to produce a string and we need to use concatenate, uh, then it will produce different strings. So let's say, uh, uh, hello. Okay, so if we have this, and we say, okay, con like fold this to me for me. So fold this uh, and fold left, and then should we use? And then we have an empty string or an empty list, okay? So should we use this or should we use, shit. should we use the concatenate like this or should we use concatenate like this? 
Yeah, then you have to think because with with this one, um, the list is on the right side, right? But with fold left, the accumulator is on the left side. So it sort of doesn't work, right? And then those guys are not lists. Like I actually do, did it wrong. Uh, so we probably have to say, um, yeah, we have, this will not work. Um, and this will not work neither because this one expects lists on both sides, right? So just for the brevity, I will do this. So we actually have lists on, it's a list of lists. Okay, so now it will work. And with the left fold, it kind of uh, keeps the accumulator uh, on the left-hand side and builds up the string, right? Uh, from left to right. But if I do the right fold, it will be building the string from right to left. So it kind of ends up with the same thing, but the order in which the, the uh, accumulator has been constructed has been kind of swapped because like this one goes from left to right and it's kind of like adding H to empty list and then E and so on. So it builds it like properly from left to right. This one builds it the opposite, but because we flipped, then now the accumulator is on the other side, the result is the same. And it takes a little while to kind of work that out. And if you flip it, then it will, um, yeah, 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 yeah. So you can flip it, but you need the what do I what I'm missing? What is the bug? The bug is probably this. So it, it is just a syntax for the uh, flipping the function, right? Haskell was confused. It treated it as an invocation of the function, not as a argument for the other function. Now it, this is an argument to flip. So now it works. So if I do flip for the right, it will be the same, the same reverse. The dollar sign instead of words for the possible? Uh, we can try. Nope, it still treats it as an invocation of the function. It tries to apply it and uh, it says, oh yeah, I'm confused. What do you mean by plus plus? There is no arguments afterwards. And so if you if you wrap it like that, it, it works. Yeah, sometimes it's a little bit confusing. I, I, I get confused sometimes myself. Okay, anyway, so that, that works. Uh, so coming back to the important things, which we kind of go back and forth uh, into. Uh, remember, remember that. So faults and then all those operators. Uh, if you know that, then you you know foundations of of Haskell. That, that there is, there is nothing that you. Of course, there are a lot of other things, but like uh, I was recently, I was kind of uh, confused by this partial thing. <laughs> so the the partial thing is kind of a combination of sequencing and the uh, and the mapping. Um, but yeah, once you cover the 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 other ones, it, then then it's. Fine. Okay. Anyway, uh, I will stop here. Uh, so what we're going to do is um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, computers and how computers work and about register machines and uh, stack machines. So if you, if you have been uh, programming on x86, uh, 
it's a example of a complex instruction set um sisk uh computer computing platform uh and the main thing here is that the assembly looks something like this you have instructions like move and then you have registers so you can say move um stuff like uh between i a a register and b register and you have a number of registers which are usually like a b c d and the registers are your word long long things so they can be the 64 bits and then you have the high and low ends of the registers and then if you say x you mean the whole register and then you have operations like uh, for example add and then uh, you say uh, you say what you want to add and you say what is the destination of the um, what are the arguments for the add and then what is the destination so sometimes you will say um, you will say things like this so you'll say add uh, one to uh, content of the a register and store the result in in uh, a register to simplify things most of the time the result goes into the a register so you don't tell what the destination is because by default it will be the a a register um, and then you can either have value here or you can have you can read a value from memory right so in general case the operation um looks like operation takes arguments and the arguments are what to do from where and where to store the result right that's how the operation kind of works so our ops our operations have arguments uh and the, those arguments are telling us what from where and so on, right? So in, in the case of add, I cannot have just add because that doesn't mean anything. I have to say add, you know, uh, 23 with 45 and then uh, implied is that the result goes to AX, right? But sometimes you will actually say add 23 to AX and store the result in BX. You can have instructions like that as well, right? Um, so the point here is that the context of the operation is fully understood together with the parameters which are passed to that operation, okay? And those machines, those machines which operate like that, we call register-based machines, right? So all that I said above, applies to register-based machines. And register-based machines are very popular and they are used for, um, you know, a lot of computing um, chip manufacturers uh, like uh, x86, ARM, uh, RISC. Uh, so Ar ARM is a RISC architecture, uh, but uh, Ultra Spark. Uh, what's the IBM one? Um, uh, Power, is it Power PC? Yeah. And so on. So all those uh, CPUs are kind of register-based machines. Fine. Do you know CPU which is not a register-based machine? So let's Google. Um, a Lisp machine was a so symbolics was the uh, Okay. okay, so 
if you read about symbolics, which is an old, uh, not con discontinued uh, CPU line, uh, you will see that the instruction set was based on a stack machine, not of the register machine. So what is a stack machine? A stack machine is designed slightly differently. Uh, we do have operations do, which we have to do, but we keep those operations argument less. We don't use any arguments for the operations, right? So if I have an add operation, it will be just add. If I have multiply operation, I will have just multiply. So then you ask, okay, so then where the arguments come into my operation and where the results go into? And the answer is from, you know, um, from the name, stack-based machines. Uh, the answer is that the fundamental uh, data structure for those machines is a stack. And what is a stack? A stack is some data structure which you can put things on top and it kind of accumulates the values and then you can pop things from top and it kind of uh, takes the values from the stack, right? You know the concept of the stack from the normal programming languages because we have the stack and heap uh, for memory allocations, right? So we allocate memory and keep variables on the stack or on the heap. And then when we release it, it kind of uh, clears the, the space. So stack is sort of like a kind of a base. And then on top of the base, you can put things. So if I say 10, 10, um, usually I say push and then push. And then so if I say, if I have two values, uh, then I will have uh, 10 on the bottom of the stack and 20 on the top of the stack. And then I can pop and then pop returns the top value from the stack. So it's a very simple data structure, which kind of grows upwards and uh, uh, goes downwards when you popping uh, uh, elements from it. And you may observe the push and pop operations and you say, okay, but push takes an argument. It actually takes the value, right? But you can kind of uh, simplify it to say, if I have a value, then I will put it on the stack. Um, and then if I have a function, so those are values. And this is uh, a function. And functions don't have any parameters and values don't have any parameters, and then values go on top of the stack and um, functions pop amount of arguments they need and then um, uh, return the value into the stack. So if we consider uh, multiplication plus and minus, for example, and if, if we consider numbers as values, we can have a very primitive um, program, which we can write. So if I want to add um, 10 plus 20, I would say 10, 10, 20 plus, right? And then what this program will do, it will put 10 on top of the stack. Then it would put 20 on top of the stack. And then it will get into the plus and plus needs two arguments. So plus will pop two arguments from the stack, which is the left-hand side and right-hand side. And then it will make the operation, it will make the plus, and then return the value into the, into the stack. So if this is my stack, then plus will eat those two values and return 30 on the top of the stack, right? And then I can have a print operation and then print will pop one element from the stack and print 30 for me, right? Um, so I can convert this into a program which says uh, get line, um, get line plus print. And then it will ask the user for input. So the user will say 10 for the first get line, 20 for the second, 
and then it will put plus and then print, right? So we have kind of like a slightly strange programming language where instructions don't have any arguments. All the arguments and all the results go back and forth from the stack, right? Um, the first programming language of that type was called, any suggestions? Fourth. Fourth is a programming language, which is somewhat ancient. Uh, and it is a stack oriented programming language with the interactive environment and blah, blah, blah. And it kind of uh, works. Um, do they have? It works as I sort of told you using that notation uh, and using the stack. Um, so you can follow the, you can check the page and you can sort of uh, see how it does things. Um, and then it has, of course, it has conditional statements and it, it is a fully fledged programming language, which uh, people used for many years. And then there was a student uh, and the student really liked that idea of um, uh, writing a language, which is um, uh, based on this kind of um, structure because this type of language has a very neat property. And uh, the neat property is that given any block of code, any block of code, you can name it. You can kind of uh, give it a name. So if I have uh, this block of code, so let's, let's kind of name this block of code B. And then I have another block of code C, which, which does something like, oh, I don't know what it is, but it does something the same way as, as uh, the structure of the program is co com composed. And I have A, I can always concatenate those chunks together. I can always say, I have a new program, which is ABC or I have a new program, which is uh, whatever. I can concatenate subroutines together and it will always form a, a correct, um, correctly working uh, program, right? So remember in Haskell, when we have uh, two functions, if I have uh, function one and function two, which return, uh, function one returns something, which function two takes, then I would write to compose them I would write function two takes what function one does. And then I need, let's say a parameter for function one. I will write, write it like this and say, uh, do function one and then pass the result to function two, right? In concatenative languages, you're actually doing it by saying F1, F2. You're doing it the opposite way, right? Because you say do F1, and then whatever F1 finished with, F2 will take as an argument and, and does something. So then I can say F3 if, I, if you want to compose three things. And then if you want to compose three things here, you have to say, say it like this, right? So it's kind of uh, flipped. And this appeals to some people, like writing code like this appeals to some people because you can compose things from left to right. Uh, in our case, we kind of writing from right right to left if we want to compose. And, and it's the same in C. Like in C, you would have to say F3, F2, F1. You would have to write it like that, right? So in C, composition is, is like that. In Haskell, it is kind of following also from right to left, but you don't need all those braces. And then in concatenative languages, it is like this, okay? So, there was a student and a couple of years ago, he actually came up with a very modern version of this concatenative language, which is called factor, factor language. And factor is, a, yeah, I didn't know there is a book actually. Uh, so factor is a, a programming language, which is a modern version of, of fourth. Uh, and it sort of looks like this. Uh, it has uh, closures, it has web frameworks, it has all the libraries for uh, a lot of uh, JSON parsing and whatnot. So you can actually build an, uh, you know, a normal program with, uh, with Factor. 
Um, and once you start with factor, you will notice that it's so weird to read like uh, the, this uh, reverse Polish notation, right? Um, so what is the reverse Polish notation? Um, so normally when we do arithmetics, we say we use infix notation, which is um, putting uh, arguments around um, around uh, operators. And then if we want to multiply it or divide it by something, we have to use braces. So we have to say, okay, um, we want to multiply it by two, right? So to get um, to get 80, we have to do this. And then we have to use braces because um, this plus has to be done before we do this multiplication, right? So there is an idea which came up with the Hewlett-Packard calculators uh, where you want to have complex arithmetic expressions, but you want to achieve the result without using any braces. And it's called reverse Polish notation. And um, so reverse Polish notation. And then the, the idea is that if you want to use reverse Polish notation, you put arguments first, and then you put the operation second, and then the operations are always done from left to right. So our, in our case, this can be written in the reverse Polish notation like 10, 20 plus to multiply, and it will work, right? And you observe that this reverse Polish notation is kind of using the stack concept, right? Because plus, takes the two elements which are kind of on a stack uh, from the left-hand side, and then it puts two on top of the stack and then does the multiplication. So if we unwind it, it will be like, again, you have a stack, you put 10 and 20 on the stack, then you reach the plus and plus pops two elements and adds them. So it will eat those two and it will make 30 and then there is a new value two, so it will put two on the stack, and then there is a multiplication, so it will multiply thirty by uh, by two, and then it will put uh, sixty on the stack, and that's the result, right? So the reverse Polish notation is to avoid braces, but it is kind of exactly the same as our concatenative concept from the uh, stack-based machines, uh, and it basically is the same uh, or achieves the same result. So why I'm telling you all of this? Because we're gonna, for assignment two, we're gonna write a simple concatenative language interpreter, which will be able to uh, interpret and execute expressions like that for us, right? So in the class on Thursday, we'll write a sim simple uh, calculator, which will be able to do those kind of uh, reverse Polish notation calculations for us. And then we will extend it to make it a little bit more into actual programming language such that we can kind of uh, feel that it can do some meaningful things. And we will use the concepts from factor. So we will use, of course, we're not gonna re-implement factor from scratch, but we're gonna use some concepts. And one of the concepts is um, a concept of the, uh, of the, uh, how they called it, um, quotation, yeah. So th that was called in the factor language, it's called the quotation. Uh, so what, what is a quotation? Uh, you can imagine that for normal operations like the arithmetic operations or adding or, you know, printing stuff, we don't need anything fancy. But if you want to do an if statement, uh, you kind of need to have a little bit of a fanciness because you have a bool here and then you have the true uh, and false blocks, right? So uh, you want to execute a true or false block uh, depending of what this bool thing is. And the normal if statement, the normal language is kind of looks like this. Uh, but we're not going to do that this way. We're not going to do the, the, this this way. We're going to do, um, uh, we will do it in such a way that we will have a uh, bool on top. We'll have a true block and false block, right? 
So we want those three things on the stack, and then we want if to be just if. So we just say if. So putting a Boolean expression on the stack, uh, if it's like a single true or false, that would be simple because you just say true, right? Or in Haskell, you would say true. But usually that's not interesting. Like what you want is, for example, you want to say, uh, like you want to use like bigger than or less than or some uh, op like logical operator. So what do you want to say is you want to say if 30 is bigger than 60 or something like some results of your computation, uh, then then that will be true or false depending what what it does, right? Or you could have a variable, right? You can you can have a variable like um, my variable, right? So if 30 is bigger than my variable then you want to do something. And this is not a single value. This is like a piece of code. This is like an expression, right? So those three things are kind of not just numbers. Those are expressions. And we need to be able to put the whole expression onto the stack, right? So we want to be able to put that into a stack. And to achieve that, there is this concept of, um, of quotation where you quote a block of code and then this block of code becomes a value type. So it's a value and it goes onto the, onto the stack, right? So you, yeah, let, let me, let me do a, a simple example. So I will say a print. So if we want to print hello or true, um, we put true. And then we say print. And if we want to say false, we would say false. And then we'll print. And then we'll do if. Okay, so now if this is our program, right? The program has three quotations, uh, which are sort of like a mini programs. And then it has an if statement. So those three quotations go onto the stack. Uh, and yeah, I did them in the wrong order. So let's imagine that they are already put onto the stack. Then uh, my program is if, and then my, my program fetches this one, and then it has to interpret it. So then this one is a program which says, um, actually it's a wrong, wrong program because it needs to be like this. So it says put 30 on, to, on the stack. So it has a separate stack um, for that program. And then it says put 30 on the stack, put my variable on the stack. Oops, on top. And then it says execute the comparison. And the comparison needs to take two arguments. It needs to take the my variable argument and the 30 argument. So then it says, um, yeah, so here we all, we already see that we have to uh, decide when we popping things from the stack, if we putting them into the right hand side, like from the right hand side to the left hand side of arguments or from the left to right. Nor normally fourth was actually doing it from right to left. But in our case, for our language, we will be doing it always from left to right. So the first argument will always go to the left-hand side. So it will be my variable. And then the second argument will go in here, right? So if I were to compare the other way around, I have to flip it. Um, so if I have to flip 30 is bigger. So I have to ask, is 30 bigger? Yeah. And then it will evaluate to true or false, right? So this execution of this program will kind of eat those two things from the stack. It will execute the program and it will say true or false, depending. And then the if, depending whether it is true or false, will, because we've already eaten up that, that thing from the top of the stack. So this is gone. And now we have two things on the stack. And if will fetch both of them but it will only do one of them depending whether it's true or false, right? So this is a simple function which executes either this one or this one depending if the top element was true or false. Do you get it? 
it it is kind of um apart from the weird syntax there is nothing really uh exotic going on in here uh we basically ex you know what we need is we need um we need uh values so like for example ints uh integers or booleans uh we need uh some operations like for example add like class and so on uh maybe like for calculator that's enough but for programming language we may want print we may want if and then we need kind of an expressions which combine operations with values uh and with other expressions such that we can um, express the code, like we can express things like this uh, this program. So in our case, um, expressions, and we need to have uh, ability to quote expressions. And that's why they are called quotations. So what does that mean? What does that mean quoting an expression? Uh, in many programming languages, uh, you can um, evaluate an expression of that language in that language itself. You cannot do that in C or C++, but you can do that in Haskell and you can do that in some uh, some programming languages where you take a block of code and you say, this block of code is a value, I can pass it around, but at some point I can kind of execute it. In C or C++ or normal languages, you do it by function, you define a function and then you can pass the function around and you can call it. Uh, but in some languages you can kind of uh, quote it. Um, and the quoting here is done by the uh, square brackets, right? So the square brackets is not, um, yeah, we, we can decide because we would like to have list as well, right? So we would like to have values which are lists. Um, so we can decide the syntax, how we want to represent the list and how we want to represent the quotation. Uh, in, in many programming languages, the quotations are represented by ticks. So something that is in the inside the back tick is considered the expression of that language, but is not executed yet. It's executed when it's called. Uh, but you can pass it around. So it's basically a string. Uh, it's a string, string which represents uh, an expression. So we could use uh, ticks as a thing. We, we can decide it like uh, a little bit later. The first thing that we will do is we will do the calculator uh, and the calculator uh, doesn't use um, you know, printing or ifing things. It's just like the arithmetic operations and numbers, right? So first we will do numbers and arithmetic operations. Um, and then we will kind of build on, on top of that. So why do we use, um, why do we do this exercise? Well, we do this exercise to kind of get a better feel of the design and kind of implications of pro programming language choices. Uh, because we, for example, will have to make a decision if we have um, if we have bool, string, and uh, numeric types, like probably we will have int and float, right? And then you have, let's say, a multiplication function. And then you have to decide what does it mean if I have two numbers. So of course, if I have two numbers, uh, that's kind of trivial. But what if I have uh, a float on one side and I have an int on another side, or I have an int on the first side and a float on the other side, what should we do? Normally you do some type coercion, right? So you have to coerce one type into another to achieve something. So usually for this, what you would, re you know, end up with is an int, but for those two things, you will end up with floats. But it's up to you. It's up to the designer of the language, right? 
Um, for example, what you could do is you could coerce to float because the first argument is a float here. Uh, so you could coerce this expression to a float, or you could say, yeah, actually, so the alternative is like coerce it to an int because this guy is an int. So maybe you can coerce this guy to an int, or maybe you throw uh, throw exception saying, no, no, I, I, I don't know. You have to be, you know, you did a mistake. You cannot multiply floats with integers. You have to tell me like, uh, like Haskell does. Haskell is very strict and it chooses this option, right? Uh, you can choose one or the other option. Another interesting question is what do you do if you have, for example, a string and it says two multiply with three, what that will produce, right? I, I uh, suggest you try those expressions in JavaScript because sometimes they are very counterintuitive, right? Uh, what does that produce? And what does that produce? Is it a legal expression in JavaScript? Yes, it is. Uh, wh what will that do? Uh, yeah. What will that do? Right? Um, th those are kind of uh, interesting language choices, which are simple, but each programming language makes those choices. And then JavaScript also makes those choices. And JavaScript is a really funny one, right? Um, because you can do all those things. Uh, and then, like, I never know what the result will be. Like, will the result be, what, what could that be? It could be five as an int, right? But it could also be 23 as a string, right? Um, and here, same same story, what that could be, same. It could be five or it could be 32 as a string. Because you have two types, but the function has to return a single type. So what that type will be? Would that be a string or would that be a number? Um, so what if you, yeah. Anyway, so we're doing this exercise because of the, of the value for kind of our thinking and discussing programming languages. There is a second, uh, second reason. The second reason is that those programming languages actually exist, like a factor exists, fourth exists. Uh, those are not um, uh, imaginary or uh, um, languages that never happened. They actually happened and people did wrote systems using those concatenative languages. So it might happen that in two years time or you know in five years time, there will be kind of some revolution and we will kind of switch to a, a bit more concatenative feel of programming languages because of the um, of the arguments that I told you. Like concatenative, lang concatenative languages, they have a very neat property of being very easily composable. And they also compose very easily like uh, from left to right. So even though the individual chunks of the, of the code, you kind of read in the Polish reverse notation where you read from right to left, the actual composition of what needs to be done actually reads like this. So why is that important? Well, it, it, it's kind of neat because um, um, you can, com like the, the beauty of concatenative languages is that they kind of are composed into human language-like structures. So what you end up is, is you define a sim simple words, um, like uh, for example, you, you, you can define like, um, I don't know, like, um, by milk, by milk will be your your routine, right? Uh, go to shop, uh, and then uh, mix milk um, with egg. So then, when you actually uh, writing your code, you end up actually saying sentences which read like normal uh, human sentences. You you would say, go to shop buy milk and then mix milk with egg. There is no brackets. There is no uh, any fancy things. 
and then you end up with um, sense sentences like that, which compose, and then going to shop will kind of put milk. Uh, no, no. So going to shop will get you to to the shop. Will get you to where you can actually get the milk from. So that will probably open like some database, open some connection somewhere. And then when you bought the milk, the milk will end up on the top of the stack. And then you will kind of uh, mixing the what you got uh, with the with the thing. So uh, you can mix with egg. Yeah. So this has a very different feel, uh, and the art of programming with concatenative languages is to form those words, is to define a dictionary of all those words, which then you use to program more complicated things. And that's what, like, if you read about factor, if you read about this, why this guy uh, did factor and uh, what was the main point. Um, is to have those dictionaries and have those words, and then you kind of uh, compose complex things by having those one-liners. Uh, because this concatenative structure is using the reverse Polish notation, usually you try not to go over a, a single line. So you kind of uh, define new things. So if I want to say um, a party, then I will say party is this thing here, which is like buying milk and whatever, whatever. Or I don't know, it's like muffin, right? And then you kind of uh, compose your programs like with those uh, with those dictionaries. So you'll have those words on the left hand side, and you'll have those definitions on the right hand side, and they are kind of uh, uh, following this kind of a human uh, uh, human like style of of communicating. And there is a certain appeal. So it's a class of languages which is somewhat, uh, you know. Um, uh, ancient because the, people don't do, like none of the modern programming languages is using the concatenative nature, but it is um, it has a certain appeal. So so that's one main reason. But there is a second reason because Lisp machines and symbolics is kind of a very important um, stage of the uh, of the ev ev evolution of the computing platforms. And as you know, they kind of go in cycles. So we started with, uh, with a complex instruction set architectures. Then we went a little bit into power PC and into kind of a risk uh, architectures. Then there was like a new era of Intel and AMD kind of a CPUs. And now we kind of went back to risk because ARM is like killing it. Like the power to performance ratios are really good with ARM. And then we may go back to something that is more fancy, like uh, something that is kind of a stack based in the future. Like we never know what the innovations will be. So it's kind of good to know that stack machines are kind of uh, a thing and that uh, the stack machines have been uh, used uh, in, in many uh, implementations. So the two very famous stack based implementations that you used a lot is Java and .NET. Java and .NET frameworks are using a virtual machine, which is not based on registers, it's based on stack. And it, using, it is using assembly language uh, and instruction sets, which are actually stack-based. So J JVM and .NET platforms are a very popular stack machines, which are used like a lot in the computing industry. And then being aware of the stack machines and stack machine uh, kind of a feel is kind of, um, yeah, uh, fundamental and, and, and relevant. So what we, what we will do is on source day, we will write a little um, expression calculator. And then we will talk a little bit more about our new programming language that we will be developing. And then we'll get some building blocks of how we can construct it. And then assignment two will be for you to kind of implement um, the missing pit bits, right? So we will not do a fully, you know, a fledged um, programming language, but a toy language which we can play with. And then you will make some decisions and you will kind of decide, design some of the features yourself. Um, and that's the, the goal for the uh, assignment two. Uh, I will think if we want to have uh, an optional assignment, uh, which because we, we only doing two assignments. 
Uh, so one is the SDL based one. The second one will be the programming language based one. But I was thinking, pro proposing a third one, which will be an optional one. And then you can do two out of three. So you don't have to do all three, you just pick the two that you want to do. And the third one would be with networking. So it will have to do with like uh, using some form of a network stack and doing something to do with network. Uh, do you think that would be useful or do you think that's not necessary? Um, okay, let's discuss it on Thursday. So I, I'm not going to do it for now. Uh, we will just have those two. And then uh, maybe we stick with the two because then we kind of con constrain the complexity just to the, those two tasks. Okay, so that's all for today. Um, thank you very much.